McCall. Thank you for being with us from your Vancouver home. I was uh, excited to have had you here, but it looked like weather prevented you from being here in person, and then weather prevented me from getting to the library on time. So it seems like every time that we <laughs> talk about getting together, snow is involved, and it's appropriate <laughs> because, you know, when you have snow, you know, my car wasn't a sled, but this guy definitely is responsible for getting a sled to homes and bringing gifts and the poem Twas the Night Before Christmas, 200th year, you have compiled a beautiful book. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying prior to this, uh, we, we got the book in the library this week. Uh, it's the art and history of the classic Christmas poem. Um, I got it out of the box and I was impressed by its weight, <laughs> its heft. <laughs> The work that must have gone into this, and as I opened the book, I mean, the the images, uh, everything inside of it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and for those of you who are interested in coming to the Potsdam Public Library and checking it out, it was the night. I have to make sure. Here it is, glare and all from the. Come see it in person. This is beautiful. Um, let me ask her, how long have you been working on this book? Well, approximately 10 years, not flat out 10 years, but certainly um, it took a lot of research because I had to travel to different archives and collections and libraries and, and to find the old editions so that I could reference them for my book. And I also went to New York several times because I wanted to see some of the sites where Clement C. Moore had lived or, or contributed to the city of New York, such as the General Theological Seminary. So it took a lot of travel and, and a lot of research. The um, the thing that ties us to this book, the thing that makes this book special to our region is that its origins, the poem's origins, are in Lewis County, Constableville, correct? Possibly. Uh, there's a family story that Clement C. Moore visited the home and was inspired by the, the style of the home. And, and he was visiting his cousin, Mary, who had recently lost her husband. She was a young woman with four children, four or five children. And so he may have visited the home and been inspired by it. That's the family story. The, um, you had done an interview with Todd Moen at CPR. And right. Todd was here uh, on Friday um, and he did some uh, readings and we talked about his uh, interview with you. And uh, one of the things that he said was uh, really fascinating was the fact that if you go to the the home, the bedroom where he was in, there was a uh, a sash, and you know the uh, the window that he throws open, all the things that you would see in the language mm -hmm. of the um, of the poem. That mm -hmm. it seems like that you could see the inspiration in the room. It's a very inspiring building. Uh, it was it's circa eighteen nineteen, so it's also the right era. And uh, the Clement Seymour home in Chelsea, where it was possibly written, the other family story, um, is no longer there. So if one wants to get a real sense of this poem in the right era and be in a room that Clement Seymour may have stood in and read the poem, it's Constable Hall. And so I find it a very romantic um, building and home. It's a beautiful museum. It has many of the original pieces of furniture and artifacts, and it's it's really something. It's not heated during the winter, so they close it down, but you can visit it. I think they're doing caroling this week um, on the steps of the home. So, you know, it's it's a very, very special place. The, um, you know, this is, this is what we talked about having you come out and visit. Um, you were here for three weeks on the East yes. Coast. Yes. Uh, you want to talk about some of the places that you visited um, and talk a little bit about your uh, your presentations before you prepare sure. your presentation for us. Sure. I uh, set out on a three week tour. I'd been to New York and Constable Hall in September and I realized that it warranted another trip out. And so I made appointments with libraries and museums and galleries and, and media. And I did a three week, 21 day, 21 city tour <laughs> in a rental car praying there wouldn't be any snow <laughs> because Avis doesn't think that people use snow tires anymore. <laughs> that was the, that was what they said to me that I, when I asked for snow tires specifically, they said, well, no one uses those anymore. All season is what everybody uses. And as a Canadian, I thought that was a bit odd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it seems a bit, well, I mean, I, I can tell you, like we talked about living, living here alone, uh, you know, uh, this this is a place where certainly I am I am using snow tires. Uh, <laughs> well, 
all the live long day. Uh, you know, sure. this time of year comes around and and you know, the snow tires go on. So, uh, you know, I think it might've been a little bit off on that one. Yes. Um, so you have a presentation for us, uh, all about putting together uh, this book, the work that has gone into it, some of the images. Uh, I got a sneak peek of that. Uh, yes. I'd love to let you uh, take the reins and, sure. and tell us all about it. I uh, learned a lot when I was on my three week tour as well. And so I prepared this PowerPoint with some revisions from what I've been presenting before. Uh, just added to it actually to try and address some of the questions I was getting from people who came to my different talks. And, and so I put the material that I was being asked about the most back into it. And uh, I also, as you can imagine, when I was three weeks on the, on the road and putting over 2,300 miles on a rental car, I, um, I also had to check some of my facts, make sure I was still on track. <laughs> so it was good to come back and regroup before I did this. <laughs> so um, I'll uh, share with you. And I um, am, you know, very grateful for you having me. And I just wanted to mention that I'm not being remunerated. And so therefore I'm able to share images that have copyright protection, um, but not for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of lovely. If you're doing things that have a commercial um, aspect to them, then of course um, copyright could be a bit of a challenge as we all know, but sure. that's just a, a caveat I wanted to mention. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes. So here, I'll just get my PowerPoint up here. Here we are. So this is the cover of my book. And I took um, a lot of uh, care choosing a cover because I want it to be very endearing. I want it to have a vintage feel. And I chose Helen Champerlin's work. I found this image in the William and Mary University at the SWEM Library, and I just loved it. And uh, she's a very unknown artist, but I thought, why not give her a day in the sun? So I chose her over some of my other choices, which might have been... Um, you know, Wyeth or Rockwell or some of these other great talents who um, who love the poem and actually illustrated uh, or, or brought images uh, from the poem to their art. No, it's absolutely, it's really, it is striking. Yes, it's great, isn't it? Yes. Gonna... So Clemency Moore um, is considered to be the poet of Christmas Eve. There are some challenges to his authorship, but as far as I'm concerned, it's Moore's. And... I always preface what I say about Moore with Benjamin Franklin's uh, modest dividends, which is if one doesn't have all the facts and there's suspect that there could be other facts, one should not become emphatic um, on their position. And so I uh, do say that Moore wrote the poem, but with the, with that um, hesitation that there could be something come to light that, that changes that. Moore claimed it as his own, in 1837, he defended it in a newspaper when someone else claims it's theirs. He hand writes it out four times, at least in his lifetime, possibly another copy with the Constable family, which we have not found yet. And his children write about it, his daughter illustrates it. And there's a lot that's been said um, that supports Clement Seymour being the author. The part that gets him in trouble is when he writes one of the editions out in later life and he puts a footnote saying, written many years ago, I don't remember when. And if only he hadn't have added those last few words because it really puts um, his authorship in question and, uh, and the possibility that Henry Livingston Jr. Um, wrote it. But there is no evidence of that being factual. So it's for now, it's Clement T. Moore's. Clement T. Moore was a graduate of Columbia University, a very intelligent man, very educated. He spoke multiple languages. He introduced opera to New York. He had um, musical abilities as well as writing. So he played a couple of instruments and uh, he was a very generous man who donated a lot of land to uh, the building of churches and to the General Theological Seminary in New York, which is still there. And I would highly recommend the next time you're in New York to go to the General Theological Seminary's chapel. It's very, very beautiful. And there's a lovely portrait of Clement Seymour there. And they have a collection of the poem in their library. So Clement C. Moore, um, some people make him out to be a curmudgeon and they say that he could never have written it because it wasn't in his character. And for everything I've read about Clement C. Moore from people who knew him, um, from his students, the General the Theological Seminary, to his children, to his grandchildren, I don't think that's correct. Um, I think that the man was very sad at the death of his wife in her early thirties. He never remarries. Um, 
but I don't think he was a curmudgeon in any way, in any possible way. So I uh, loved reading about Clemency Moore's life and his family. His mother, um, a daughter of the American Revolution, his father, the Bishop of the Diocese of New York, who gave the last rites to Alexander Hamilton. And it said that if Benjamin Moore, the Bishop Benjamin Moore, had not written notes about what had happened at the duel um, with Hamilton, we would not know it was a duel. It would have been written off as a gunshot wound, as an accident. So kind of interesting family. They go way back um, in early American history, and they also have some very, very interesting uh, British um, ancestors. So as I mentioned, uh, Clemency Moore, he's born in um, 1779. So he comes to this, um, he's you know four years old at the end of the American Revolution, and he dies in 1863, and the American Civil War is, ends in 1865. So his, his life is bookmarked by these two major events in American history. And so the period you're covering here is, is really, really fascinating. It's also the development of America and American culture in art and writing and politics, of course, but really, you know, a fun period, of course, to work on um, when you're looking at the art. This is a painting by the wonderful Howard Ply, um, who does a lot for the uh, development of art in America, which I'll expand on in a little while. This is the Clemency home in Chelsea, New York. It's no longer there. It was torn down and thrown into the Hudson River. And this is where Clemency Moore grew up. There's um, a lot of thought that he actually wrote the poem here. He may have been inspired by Constable Hall, but he wrote it here for Christmas Eve of 1822. Um, we know that there was a snowstorm in the winter or the Christmas time of 1822 in New York. And uh, the theory is that he went out on a sleigh ride and he was struck by the magic of the snow and the jingle bells and the moonlight. And, and he just you know came up, dreamt up this wonderful poem and dashed back into his home and you know, wrote it out for his children and his wife and his mother who were waiting um, for their Christmas poetry. Um, you know, it's a it's a lovely idea. It's a lovely story. Um, there's not a lot of factual evidence to support it, but it's it's a lovely story. And uh, and I think it adds to the poem to to relate that. The poem was published in the Troy Sentinel newspaper for December twenty third, eighteen twenty three. So it's a year after Clement Seymour wrote it. Troy Sentinel is uh, north, as you know, of Hudson um, in New York. And the Troy Sentinel was published at the time by William Parker and edit the editor was Orville Hawley. So Orville Hawley takes the poem, it's given it to him, is given, it's given to him anonymously as an anonymous poem. There's no, no author credited to it by we think Sarah Sackett, a woman who ran a shop with her husband next door to the Troy Sentinel. And it appears on page four, there's no illustration. It's just simply there. But the one thing that's terrific about the 1823 edition, the first edition is Orville Hawley writes a glowing preface. And that preface follows the poem around when it's transported to other newspapers in the coming months and years. This image is from 1830 and it's the first illustration of, a, of the poem and it's by Myron King. And it's the Troy Sentinel as well. And we've lost this original woodcut, but they do have copies of this um, in different archives in New York. Uh, so you know, it's a very sort of um, um, basic, but it gives you the sense there of reindeer and the roof and Santa. This is the next illustration. This is the first illustration in an actual book and it's in the New York Book of Poetry. Oh, no, it's in Poets of America, I'm sorry, in 1830, 1840. This is 1840. And it's interesting because he's somewhat elf-like, but he's actually more like a father figure, even this early on. Um, so I, I find I have a copy of this, actually, and I, I collect a lot of these editions. This is worth about $500 US to collect. Not that rare, but very, very early. This is the poem, as I mentioned, as it appeared, it appeared with the title, Account for, of a Visit from St. Nicholas. We now know it as Twas the Night Before Christmas or The Night Before Christmas or An Account of a, of a Visit from St. Nicholas and all kinds of other variations. The poem was changed by editors, I think primarily because it didn't have an author and they felt they had uh, liberty to do what they wanted to do with it right from the beginning. 
And so you see in 1828, the happy Christmas moves to Merry Christmas and then back and forth. Some people like happy Christmas, some people like Merry Christmas. And they they just change it at will. Um, a lot of the punctuation changes and some of the other language changes included the name of the reindeer um, going back and forth between the German and the Dutch derivative of Dunder and Blitzen. This is uh, 1841 and you have the first illustration of Santa Claus descending a chimney. And it was published in the New York Mirror. And the interesting thing about this is that it refers to it happening on New Year's Eve. And back in this day, um, in the 18, early, 18, early 1800s, you had a lot of uh, people celebrating Christmas Eve um, or New Year's Eve. And the variety of activity would be from, you know, guns going off and festivities and lots of drinking and partying and everything else, which was a New Year's Eve kind of idea. Um, and very few people were sort of celebrating Christmas Eve in the home in sort of a, the way that we tend to, we now do it ourselves. Um, there would have been Christmas Day, there would have been, you know, religious ceremonies and things, but the giving of presents was either a New Year's Eve thing or some people were doing it on Christmas Eve. This is uh, also the image that's taken from the 1841 New York Mirror, and it's placed in an Albany newspaper the following year in 1842, and it's used to advertise toys for the Pierce Variety Store. So this is the first time you see the commercialization of Santa Claus. It's, it's 1842. <laughs> so he didn't have long to go before we started, you know, realizing his great popularity and his ability to sell. Um, and he's been used, as we all know, ever since to sell wares. He's considered to be, I think, the most influential character of all time and the best salesperson. Kind of fun. 1858, you have Winslow Homer, the incredibly talented Winslow Homer comes to Harper and he starts using the poem. You can see the imagery here of the stockings, the children sleeping, the parents. Um, so I just love Winslow Homer and it was just fun to see how many great artists came to this work and used it in their own illustration for magazines, newspapers and, and fine art. Um, it's It was an exercise I did. I just would think of an artist like, Max Parrish, and then I go looking, and I find that he did illustrations for the, for the front of a Saint Nick of a Santa Claus monument building in New York. He also did a beautiful rendering of Saint Nicholas for Knickerbocker for Washington Irving. So for the Washington Irving book, so really interesting to find um, all of these different artists coming to this poem, including Andy Warhol and Norman Rockwell and Lion Decker, and, and it's hard to find you know, a major talent who didn't at some point. Um, even Andrew Wyeth uh, painted a Christmas card of a bed with stockings hung on the on the bedposts, and his wife Betsy did a, a beautiful Christmas card of Santa. So you know, so many artists came to this work who were inspired by it. Here we have um, the full piece of uh, the newspaper of this Winslow Homer uh, image. And at the bottom, I think this is a really important image because it shows there was still this sort of conflict between inside and outside Christmas that Christmas in New York and, and many places in, in America at the time were an outdoor activity that were, you know, rowdy. And there was lots of, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, gunshots and fireworks and, and just, you know, rambunctious behavior. and Sort of in the feel of Saturnalia. So there was a real sort of interest um, to bring it inside and to make it sort of a calmer family event. And I think Clement C. Moore was conscious of that. And I think that that's part of what this poem achieves is to bring it into the home and away from the streets. Um, and in the poem, it even says, you know, nothing to dread. Um, so I think that's interesting that he chose those words to include. There's a bigger meaning, of course, too, that before Clement Seymour does Twas Not For Christmas, many of the poems talk about a birch rod or a, a threat of punishment if you're not, you're nice. And you know, if you don't make the list or someone reports your behavior, you might not get a Christmas present. So um, Clement Seymour's Twas Not For Christmas is kind and benevolent and no one is being threatened. It's inclusive and lovely. And I think that's why it survived. I don't think it would have survived if it had the threat of children being beat up. <laughs> If they were naughty, I just can't imagine Bess Truman or any other first lady, which is the tradition in the United States every Christmas season to read it at the White House. I just can't imagine that happening if it was talking about beating people up, especially children. Uh, so the poem goes on. And uh, in the 1860s onward, it's these beautiful old antique editions. 
They're called luxury books. They often have a guild on them. And then lots and lots of artists come to this poem and illustrate it. Here's another really beautiful image of a vintage uh, Twas Before Christmas. And the title here is The Night Before Christmas or A Visit to St. Nicholas. So they really, you know, there's recognition that it was first titled A Visit from St. Nicholas, but these, they, they struggle with the two um, back and forth. I think part of it has to do with the fact that Twas Before Christmas describes St. Nicholas as an elf. And so they sort of move away from the St. Nicholas in the religious context towards an elf character. I think by changing the name of the poem to The Night Before Christmas, it kind of gets away from the St. Nicholas. Although in the language of the poem, he's always called St. Nicholas or St. Nick. He's not called Santa Claus. Coming to St. Nicholas, um, when I was doing my work, it was really interesting to work on Clement's humor, but I realized that the legend of St. Nicholas is really at the heart of this poem. And you have to go back to the Roman empire. You have to go back to the third century with St. Nicholas. And here he is in this beautiful painting, throwing gold through the wall, through the open, opening window, open window um, to a family that father's struggling to pay a dowry for his daughters and they're at risk of being sold into slavery or prostitution. And so St. Nicholas comes anonymously and at night and throws the gold to save the girls. And he doesn't want to be identified. And the father stays up one night to see who's doing this. And then they have this encounter where St. Nicholas explains, I, it's anonymously giving from God, it's not me. But of course the legend builds and it, it's granted that it is St. Nicholas doing these wonderful deeds. This is one of the major legends of St. Nicholas. There are many of saving children, of saving ships and ship and sailors. But this is probably the most famous. And it's also the most important to our story because this is the essence of our story and the, um, and the giving of, of gifts anonymously by Santa Claus. This is um, now time to discuss the huge influence in America on Christmas, which is Washington Irving. Washington Irving wrote Knickerbocker in 1809. He published it and released it on St. Nicholas Day of 1809. And he references St. Nicholas 25 times in the book. He has him flying around in a wagon over the houses of Manhattan. And there was a real interest at the time at the early you know, 1900s or the 1800s to uh, create a gem time or a sort of a, invent some customs that sort of drew back to the past. And, and there was an effort to sort of make this sort of rowdy behavior and, and the changing scene in New York um, go back to how it was. And so I think many people would consider that Washington Irving was an inventor of traditions brilliantly. And uh, he's a wonderful writer, very funny. And I loved working on Washington Irving. I, I, I read everything about him. I, I read his five volume set his biography of uh, George Washington, who he's named after. And I just loved him. He was a fascinating man, traveled, well-educated, um, very popular, very good friends with Dickens, all kinds of people. But his influence on Santa Claus and Christmas was huge. And in 1820, he writes five Christmas stories in Old Christmas, part of the sketchbook. And he doesn't have Santa Claus coming down chimneys like Moore does in 1822, but he does establish old traditions and, and uh, the idea of sort of a merry old Christmas and, and that we should sort of bring that back into our society. And he does so because he's visited Sir Walter Scott in Abbotsford in Scotland and been inspired by um, Sir Walter Scott and his, his, you know, sort of romantic ideas of old times. And he also was encouraged by Walter Scott to study German folklore and, and German folk tales and German language. And from there, he gets the ideas of Rip Van Winkle and Sleepy, and Sleepy Hollow, but also some Christmas. So some people credit um, Washington Irving with inventing Santa Claus. I don't do that, but I think that we should give him credit for a lot of what he did do as establishing Christmas holidays and his influence on Dickens, which I'll talk about in a little while. John Pittard um, was a statesman in New York, a very, very illustrious man. Um, I read his biography. It, was, it would make you dizzy. He was an incredibly accomplished individual. And uh, he promoted the idea of St. Nicholas being the patron state of America. He wanted him everywhere. 
and uh, he was in New York at the same time as as uh, Washington Irving and and Clement Moore and, and Julian Verplank and all these people. And he didn't get to have that wish fulfilled, but he did have a big role in starting the St. Nicholas dinners at the New York Historical Society in 1810, which continued on and uh, very, very interesting man. This is uh, James Fenmore Cooper, another American writer who I think is really important to our story and needs to be recognized because James Fenmore Cooper wrote The Pioneers in 1822. He finished it in 1822. And it's important to say that because he did so before the publication of Twas the Night Before Christmas. And in The Pioneers, in the very beginning, you see, you hear James Fenmore Cooper's character talking about, we must get home. They're on a sleigh ride going home for Christmas. We must get home because Santa Claus comes tonight. And that may be the first time, I think it is, um, that Santa Claus is, is referenced as Santa Claus in American literature. So I think that's really important. And Donner and Blitzen are also mentioned as they are in Sir Walter Scott's work. So it was, a, it was an expression, thunder and lightning in translated from Dutch or German, but it's, um, it's interesting that the reindeer, two of the reindeer are named um, with, those, with those two names that were referenced in other literature. And I think it's also important to say that, you know, Twice Night for Christmas, may have been influenced by these other works, but it was centuries in the making because it drew threads, as I've already pointed out, through St. Nicholas. But because Clement Seymour was such an educated man, as were many of these other people, um, you know, a line from Hamlet shows up too, right? Not a mouse stirring is from Hamlet, you know? So it's, when you come to who actually wrote it or, or you know, how original is it, it, it does certainly draw on threads from other people um, and through centuries. So now we come to Dickens. So Dickens comes along. It's always important to reference Twas Night for Christmas to Dickens Christmas Carol because they are the two most prominent um, Christmas literary works. And Charles Dickens writes Christmas Carol in 1843. So it's a good 20 years plus one, if you give Clement Seymour the credit of 1822 um, after you know Twas is written. So that's quite a long time. And Charles Dickens is heavily influenced by Washington Irving, as I mentioned. If you read Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol and you read the Christmas stories by Washington Irving and you read Sir Walter Scott, you cannot help but see the influence that they had on each other. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really something. And Charles Dickens said that he admired Washington Irving so much that he carried Knickerbocker around in his pocket and that he mused with him more than anybody else in his lifetime. So they did meet. Um, I know that when on uh, Charles Dickens' second trip to America, they met. Uh, but um, it just can't be underestimated how important he was. Irving was to 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 Christmas Carol and Dickens. It can be said that Charles Dickens and Walsh, Washington Irving created Christmas dinner as we know it, and. It can be said too, I think that Clement Seymour created Christmas Eve the way we know it with reindeer and Santa Claus and presents with the influence of all these other people as I've already shared. When you come to illustrating the poem um, in 1862, you have, Clem you have F. O. C. Darley. And F. O. C. Darley is considered to be the father of American illustration, incredibly talented man. He was self-taught and he ended up um, illustrating everybody's works. He did Cooper's, he did Irving's, he did Dickens, he did everybody. And uh, he was so famous, he went by Darley. Um, and this is a wonderful illustration of Twas Night Before Christmas by Darley. It's one of my very favorite editions. And I just discovered one in a home in a mat of a in a home in Richfield, New York, uh, Boston antique dealer has one in a in a collection in his home. So um, they're not that easy to find. So that was that was really thrilling to actually find this. That was actually the addition too. I should always mention that um, Theodore Roosevelt read when he was four years of age. Puts it in context. This is Louis Prang. Louis Prang came to America from Germany, and he was the one who really introduced printing um, in a massive way in color. And Louis Prang did Christmas cards. He did a lot of reproductions of art. And I think that you can credit him with democratizing art in America because before him, before Louis Prang came along, you, you either had 
you know, original works of art in your home or, you know, or you didn't. I mean, it was like, with really praying, you could all of a sudden have reproductions and it changed interior design. It was an amazing development. So I, I put him on the back of my book, uh, an image by him, because I just thought he deserves to be remembered and recognized for his contribution to, to America and art. This is a image by Ellen Klopsaddle, who was the leading postcard artist between 1890 and 1905, 1910. There was a big um, push to do Christmas cards, uh, as well as Christmas cards during this era. And she was an American who became very, very uh, popular. She did over 3,000 images. And she's very collectible to this day and had a very um, tragic life. She ended up investing heavily in German printing presses with her fortune she'd made in America. And uh, they were all blown up during the war. And uh, she suffered greatly and collapsed and ended up dying in an institution um, as a young woman. But this um, image, she's credited with possibly making a, a gentler Santa than we'd seen, you know, a really kind, rosy cheeked you know, happy kind of Santa. And uh, I really enjoyed her story, um, just, you know, getting to know the details of it and, and uh, the pathos of it. Uh, Denslow, another huge American talent, 1902 does Twas Night for Christmas. And Denslow is famous for illustrating The Wizard of Oz. He made so much money from the royalties of The Wizard of Oz that he ended up buying an island and calling himself King Denslow and living out his life. <laughs> very, very um, interesting, colorful character. And I have a couple editions of his. I, I, I think they're really original. I think they're really colorful and great. And they're not that hard to get hold of. So it's just really fun. Jesse Wilcox Smith, 1912. So that's 10 years after Denslow comes along. And she does an edition that's one of the most iconic editions of the poem ever. Uh, she was extremely um, talented, but also very, very famous. She illustrated every single cover of Good Housekeeping magazine from 1915 to 1933. And so she had a huge fan base. And today her work is collected in many, many major American museums and, and worth a great, great deal of money. Um, you can buy one of these editions for hundreds of dollars. Um, there were many, many printings in, in 1912. So you might not get a first edition, but you might get a 12th or, you know, and they're three, three, three to $500. This is on the cover of the edition. It's um, really lovely. This original illustration sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars recently. So you may recognize her work. This is a, a spread from, the, from her edition, 1912. This is a wonderful image um, that we don't see very often, of Santa in a balloon, but it just shows like the number of artists that came to this um, and used the character in their own artwork. This is Frank Schoonover, and he was one of the uh, students of Howard Ply at the Drexel Institute. And Howard Ply was a very famous artist who many people were known for pirates, but he also um, was a great tutor and mentor of other artists at the Drexel Institute. And he mentored uh, and taught Jesse Wilcox Smith, Gertrude Kay, N.C. Wyatt, Joseph Leyendecker, Frank um, Schinover, and many, many others. So without hard reply, you know, these artists would probably not have the careers they, they end up having. And we wouldn't have these wonderful uh, images that we've been invited with. Here's another one of his work, and it's. I was going to ask a question really quick. Sure. And I'm looking at these images, and plus, as I'm skimming through the book and I'm watching, you know, there, and and you're just talking about the very the various depictions of Saint Nicholas, also known as Santa Claus, and I'm looking at say uh, we got uh, Manning, E.J. Manning, uh, who I'm looking at, and or uh, E.F. Manning, uh, Eliza F Fanny. Yeah. Manning. Artwork. Yes. And I'm looking, you know, where Santa Claus is depicted with, you know, a brown robe with a green interior and the hood. And and you're looking back at the one where it shows um, with uh, the Wilcox cover where Santa is in this big brown getup, almost looking like more like a bear with a beard. Right. Because he's a, right. You know, it seems like it's gone moving from this uh, gentleman in like the hoods and the browns and the very like almost uh, woodland getup to mm -hmm. the you know, red, the red and black and white that we come to know him as today. 
um, and and this may be I could be getting ahead of myself. This may be something that you you planned on addressing, but uh, I was I was curious about. Did you find in your in your studies and looking through these things where you saw the move away from some of this like again like woodland or uh, elven uh, kind of uh, gentleman to the Santa Claus that we know now and the way he's depicted? Right. Well, it's interesting because so many artists come to this poem and they and they just put their own touch on it, and some of them you know, we'll make him an elf. And even to this day, you can get editions where he looks very elfin, but then you'll find somebody else who does him as a full human, you know, really father, father or grandfather figure. And the colors change for sure. I mean, red certainly becomes predominant and it becomes predominant in the 1890s. But, and I think, you know, we sort of think of Coca-Cola as being kind of the inventors of the red, but you can look at paintings from this, you know, 17th century and you see, you know, red velvet with white fur in different images of, of you know, famous, you know, Dutch masters. And it's related to St. Nicholas and has real um, uh, a connection to something beyond just, you know, a choice of a color. And, and that comes back into our story um, for sure when people start using red and white with Santa Claus. But I think um, it's really a poetic license and it's, you know, it's, these illustrators just, you know, chose the colors that they wanted to, to use. This, um, this image is interesting because I always like to stop here for a moment and just think about the pilgrims and how they'd left behind the court of James I and Shakespeare. They'd been brought up by that. Their Christmases as little children would have been Twelfth Night. It would have been feasting and festivities and, and, all with, and pageantry and, and Shakespeare. And they came to America and they rejected it all. And, and yet the one thing that they brought that I think is incredibly important to remember is they they brought an interest in reading. And the pilgrims believed that little girls and little boys should read, not just little boys. And so they taught everyone how to read, including servants. And they paid for teachers to teach servants how to read. And so in American early history, you find these great writers and you find uh, this legacy that carries on through into Christmas writing as well. But you have Harriet Beecher Stowe, who writes a book, the Pilgrims at Christmas, you have, um, and, and other Christmas books that she wrote, Louisa May Alcott, of course, in Christmas, uh, Susan Fenmore Cooper. And there's just so many women writers that are um, so prominent and it comes from this tradition. So although the Pilgrims um, did not celebrate Christmas and they did not celebrate Christmas Eve, um, th- you know, it was absolutely not part of their um, regime. They, um, they did write. And I think that's their their real legacy to America was their interest in education and writing. This is James um, Percival. And I put this slide in here because I always like to stop for a minute here and just mention that when you're doing research, it's really rewarding to fix uh, a mistake. (laughs) And I found a few mistakes um, for sure. And one of them was there was a poem, a lovely winter poem published in the Troy Sentinel newspaper around the same time as Twice Night Before Christmas was published. And it was not credited to anyone. It, it said it was an anonymous poem and never been published. And that actually wasn't correct. It was actually a Percival poem and it actually had copyright. And it's interesting because I had thought possibly that as a literary sleuth trying to decide on this whole authorship issue that possibly this unknown poem if we could tie it to Moore or somebody else it would tie us to the Troy Sentinel in a different way but in that research I discovered it was Percival but that wasn't the most interesting correction the most interesting correction I think in my 10 years of working on this was the correction of the notion that Clement C. Moore had slaves there is no evidence of that in fact, there's evidence he did not have slaves. And uh, I pulled all the slave records and other journalists and writers in New York have also done the same thing. And no one has found anything that, that makes that a credible statement. In fact, his father had slaves and financed slave ships, but not Clement Seymour. This was probably the most um, fascinating discovery I made was the fact that Mary O'Dell, this silhouette is of Mary O'Dell. She was the one, we believe, who wrote the first handwritten copy of the poem on paper watermarked 1824. And that handwritten copy is up in the Fredericton Museum in Canada. And how it got there, we're not too sure, except for the fact that she is the daughter of Jonathan O'Dell. 
And Jonathan O'Dell was the godfather of Clement C. Moore. He was an American, he was a surgeon, but he was also loyal to the, to the king during the American Revolution. He was a spy. And he ends up decoding all of the correspondence between the British and Andre and Benedict Arnold. And after that affair, he goes to England and he's given a commission in Canada. He never comes back to the United States. But he does write to his godson, Clement C. Moore, but nothing about the poem, just about other other business. But that was really fun to discover and to and to read all about this very interesting spy um, and how he got around the United States um, undetected with a letter from George Washington, which gave him free passage for life, which I found in the Library of Congress. I don't think George Washington realized who the man was or what he was up to. This is um, coming back to Constable Hall, which we talked about at the beginning. It's this wonderful museum in Constableville, New York. This is the home of Mary Constable and uh, William Constable. He dies tragically um, in an accident. Uh, he lingers for two years, but it's an accident caused in the building of this home. And he is, Clement, they are related to Clement Clark Moore. Uh, and it, it is possible that the poem, you know, was inspired on this visit by Clement Seymour. It's possible um, that he took inspiration from the in, inside shutters, the fireplaces in every room, the dreaminess of the home, um, but we don't have any hard evidence. There's a chess set in the home that is believed to be Clement Seymour's. And uh, it's interesting that in Columbia, I found the only photograph of Clement Seymour and he's actually playing chess. So. <laughs> We found out that he, we know he played chess. We just don't know for sure that this chess set is actually Clement Seymour's. There are several desks. I uh, pulled Clement Seymour's will, and I believe uh, there were three desks talked about in that will. One of them is in the Newport Museum, and one of them is in the New York Historical Society. And the one in the Newport, we believe he wrote the 1860 edition on that he gave to, um, to a friend. And the New York Historical Society believes that their desk is the one the poem was actually written on in 1822. Um, not sure, but that's, that's, that's the story. <laughs> now we're coming back to Thomas Nass because he, he really deserves a moment here uh, on his own in that Thomas Nass was such an important artist. He comes to the Harpers in 1863 um, during the American Re Civil War, but he takes on Santa Claus um, pretty quickly and he gets really involved in depicting Santa Claus, not only, you know, bringing presents for children, but, you know, writing letters to children and living in the North Pole and doing all kinds of things. He loves Santa Claus. He had two small children. Um, he's a, he's has a German background and he just uh, came at it with everything. So this is considered to be the portrait of St. Nicholas or, Saint, or Santa Claus painted by Thomas Nast. This is the first image he ever did. It's 1863. As you can tell, the American Civil War is still raging and he's definitely taken the side of the North. And this is little Santa Claus handing out presents. Um, the editorial is very political. Um, and the character of course is, but has been politicized by Thomas Nast for Harper's. Here's how the whole page appeared. Um, there's lots and lots of detail in there that is very political um, and uh, it's interesting to see because on the on the other side of the conflict, they politicized it too. They used St. Nicholas as well in Santa Claus um, in the South. So both sides tried to claim them and uh, make it work for them. During this uh, period after the American Civil War, there's this interest in family. Again, this is everyone's trying to come home or rebuild lives or start lives or just get over this terrible conflict. And so this interest in home life in, in family is, is paramount. Here you have the introduction to the Christmas tree. Um, there are Christmas trees in America before this in the 1840s, but it's really after the Civil War that Christmas trees take off in a big way. They begin as tabletop and then they go to full length, full height. But this is just a lovely image um, by Thomas Nast of coming home. As you mentioned, uh, the whole red and white thing does come into the 1880s, 1890s with the development of color uh, presses. Before this time, everything had been hand tinted. So the work of like FOC Darley and people like that, it would have been hand painted, hand done primarily by women, um, which was a terrific sort of 
a starting point or, or place for women to begin art careers. And it led to women becoming illustrators. And I think that's really wonderful because it was an accepted career path for a woman to go into art or illustration. And there are more than you would think of. I mean, I think a lot of people think that there were a lot of women artists, but there actually were a lot of portrait artists, um, fine artists, illustrators, book designers. There were a lot of women in the arts and especially in book production, such as the case of Jesse Wilcox Smith, who we've mentioned, and Gertrude Kay, who became very, very wealthy and successful women, and many, many others too. So here's um, my edition that I was given when I was four years of age. So people always ask me, what are your favorite editions? This has to be my favorite because I've had it my whole life. Um, I'm sure it was 25 cents or somewhere like that in 1958. I was, I'm 64 years old, so this is as old as I am. Um, I, was given, I was given this copy when I was, I think, four years of age. And it's worth a couple of hundred dollars right now. They're collectibles. But, you know, to some of us, these things are priceless because we've had them our whole, our whole life and childhood through adulthood. And we've shared them with our children and grandchildren. So it's a wonderful little addition. And um, it sort of started my collection. Very happy, jolly Santa, 1958. This is another of my very favorites. Um, Everett Shin is a major American fine artist. Um, his work is really quite stunning, but he did turn his hand to The Night Before Christmas. And it is one of the most magical editions just because of the man's incredible talent. Um, it is so well illustrated. And here we have a tiny elfin character. He is in the red, um, but he's, he's an elf, um, you know, and a very happy, merry little elf. And so I think, I think Everett Shin's edition is, is really one of the best. And I think Jock Elliott, the major collector, collector of this poem, I, he put him on the cover I, of his catalog. I think that he thought so too. <laughs> and I have a copy of this. It's, it's not that hard to get. It's probably between 50 and hundred dollars to get a vintage edition of this online. So just really, really terrific work. And then of course, everybody will be familiar with this. This was just a it's still published. It's an incredibly popular little book. It's the little golden book, a version, a version of Twas. And it has everybody in it is dressed in Victorian costume. Um, the poem is not Victorian. Um, it's Regency. So it's 1819. So it's always fine when people sort of make it a Victorian um, Victorian poem, but it, it actually isn't. It's earlier than that. Queen Victoria comes to the throne, I think, in 1840. So a little bit, little bit off. This is my edition I published in 2012. It's a smoke-free edition, meaning I took away the lines, the 13 words and the, and the pipe from the illustration. I wanted to do it because I wanted to make a statement about we need to protect our children from the uh, tobacco industry's advances to this day. And uh, it won eight book awards and was spoofed by Stephen Colbert and was a really big media sensation. It uh, was talked about in China and Bombay and all over the world, actually, it was kind of crazy, <laughs> but it did a lot for the book. And, and I think the campaign was uh, well received um, in that it still sells really well on Amazon. I still, you know, publish it and, and it's been um, just a really great project to be involved in. How did you get involved in that, Pamela? I, um, outside of my professional work, I work as a child's rights activist on drug prevention and on tobacco prevention. And I was looking for something to do that would help the campaign. And I just came up with the idea of taking away the pipe from Santa and no one had ever done that. And so it, it just, it hit this nerve and it went everywhere from the New York Post to Barbara Walters, to NBC Nightly News, to Vanity Fair, Associated Press, BBC. It just went absolutely everywhere. I think it was 200 pages deep on Google at one point. It was just so many people took offense to what I did and thought I shouldn't have done it. And yet so many people thought I, it was a great thing to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always mention, you know, Paul McCartney took the turkey out of the Christmas song because he doesn't, he's a vegetarian, vegan. <laughs> and I don't think anybody even noticed. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> but with me, I mean, I had books flying at me. So, no, it was pretty crazy. It still is. I still get some slack from some people sometimes who think that I shouldn't have touched it. But as I mentioned earlier, this poem has been altered thousands of times, like thousands of times. So for me to alter it, um, in this way, you know, I, I think it was within my right to edit it. It wasn't censorship. Um, censorship, as you well know, is, is when you, you know, make it so someone can't obtain a copy of something they wanted to read. Well, this is not the case. You can go and buy a smoke filled Santa Claus edition anywhere, anytime within minutes. 
So no one is depriving anyone of that. I was just offering an option. Hey, you know what they say, you know, whether you're getting um, a good uh, critique, bad critique or otherwise, uh, it's still promotion, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, sure. Now, I mean, I just to, to sort of emphasize, emphasize my point here is here we have Santa Claus, you know, selling cigarettes, you know, until 1998, this was legal. You know, 1998, the United States government said, nope, can't do that anymore. <laughs> no more Joe Camel and no more using cartoon characters to sell cigarettes. So um, it's illegal. Thankfully, um, they really hijacked Santa. I, I thought they did. They really used him. Um, and so just to sort of go over this a little bit further, you know, I worked on this, but I also worked on it from a basis of science that, you know, a lot of young children um, do not want people smoking and they certainly don't want smoke at Santa. And they were writing letters to Santa Claus asking him to Get their parents to quit smoking and so i thought the last thing a five-year-old who's written that letter needs to see is santa claus puffing away in her in this beautiful book she just got so i um, i did it for children and uh this was just the research that we did show, you know that just that children do not enjoy people smoking and they were willing to give up the christmas presents if their parents would quit um i thought that was pretty significant yeah and and then we published it in spanish and mandarin and in french and um, so getting back to our story on Twas, though, I um, the derivatives, the, the published works that came from this poem, from this St. Nicholas magazine, which was, you know, a groundbreaking magazine at its time. And it introduced people like Kipling. I mean, they introduced, you know, wonderful artists and, and illustrators and writers to American children. Um, you know, it's Fitzgerald wrote in this. I mean, there were so many people that they found and introduced to America through this magazine named St. Nicholas. But there have been so many other derivatives too, like Grinch and, and all these, you know, wonderful stories that may never have come to us had there not been Twas, because they were at the base of them is the story of Twas Night Before Christmas. Um, I find that really sort of interesting. And I give Twas a lot of credit for all of this. Um, coming back to the Christmas Carol, these are the two, I think, of all the literature that we have. And as you, you know, as a librarian and also, you know, myself in the book publishing world, there are thousands of Christmas books for children. I mean, every year, beautiful children's books from, you know, little puppies and all these things. And, and yet these two classics, the Christmas Carol and Twas Night Before Christmas, are still the most prominent, you know, pieces of literature. And Christmas Carol, I just went to a reading of it by um, the great, great grandson of, of Charles Dickens in, um, in Massachusetts. It was wonderful. And he gives a performance there every year at Valancourt Folk Art. But I think a lot of people watch the film version now. I think they watch Alistair Sim or other versions of it. I don't know how, how many people sit down and read Christmas Carol, whereas Twas Night for Christmas, although there have been silent films made of it and adaptions of it, all kinds of TV and movie, people still read it. Families still sit around and yeah, I go to a library and I'll see like 17, 20 editions of this in, in the small little library. Um, it's so popular. And, you know, families often say that they pass it around to each other. And each person reads a few lines. You know, it's been um, just lovely to hear all those lovely family memories of, of Christmas with this poem. You know, there's a great version, if you can find it, I think it's online, mm -hmm. of um, <clears throat> Neil Gaiman reading from the original Dickens script, the notations, I believe it was, uh, at the New York Public Library. Uh, and he good. comes in dressed up and he's got the top hat and he, he grew like wore like the little the beard to, to dress up sort of like Dickens, I guess it had been at the time. Um, and it's really wonderful to listen to him read this story. Um, and I think it goes without saying that, I mean, one of, one of the most marvelous uh, versions of the films uh, was with Michael Caine and the Muppets, of course. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Terrific. Absolutely. Really great. No, it's um, it's been really fun to look at all the versions of Twas too, like King Charles, Prince Charles, King Charles. He has an edition now where he reads it with Camilla and uh, Judy Dench and, and Maggie Smith. It's really fun. It's, I mean, so many people um, have done it, like just many actors, many, you know, public figures, lots and lots of people. And uh, this is an interesting book. This is The Boy Who Lived in Pudding Lane. I published 
this from the original from 1921. And it's a story of Santa Claus as a little boy growing up. And it has Mother Goose as uh, Santa Claus's grandmother. And I thought, how fun is this idea? But then I realized that it actually, in my research, I found it was, it was not um, Sarah Addington that came up with that. You can see it in the work of Thomas Nast, where Mother Goose is flying through the air with Santa Claus. She's on a, a goose, of course, and he's in a sleigh. And, and, you, and it goes way back. Um, that Santa Claus and, and Mother Goose are related. But it's interesting that we've lost that in the last hundred years. Uh, we lost that piece, but I don't think I've met anybody who knew that <laughs> Santa Claus and Mother Goose were related. <laughs> heard that before. That's riotous. Well, it's, it, I know, it, isn't it interesting that we've lost it? And yet it was, it was there for a good hundred years and then we lost it somehow. So I don't know. But anyway, so I republished this. I had it redesigned. Um, and it was just a really fun project. It's a lovely little story by a very famous artist, Gertrude Kay. Um, the illustrations are worth it. Just there's five or six illustrations, but they're absolutely beautiful. Um, that I'm looking at some of the illustrations and you're mentioning some of them. I'm pulling them up online on my yeah. computer just to uh, see if we have them in the library and maybe get them for the library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. The folklore and the illustrations are wonderful. They are. So the poem, as I, as I mentioned, has been around for 200 years. It's celebrating its writing and reading bicentennial in 1822, 2022. And then its centennial for its first publication is 2023. So it's been enjoyed for 200 years uh, by children and adults and everyone. And this magic of Christmas is still so much alive. You can look around, there's lights up and trees up. And, you know, Christmas is such a big part of our life. Um, some people celebrate it for two months of the year. You know, it, it's just a very big holiday. And, and, and much of that credit, I think, must come to the uh, poem. It's such a, an exciting poem, and it's so full of anticipation and hope and, and wonderment. And that's really, you know, the essence of Christmas Eve still for many, many people. And then this is just my um, slide just to discuss the, the collecting of the poem. As I mentioned, I am a collector. There are major collections in America. There's one... I think there's one private, it's over a thousand pieces. The biggest collection is at the William and Mary um, University. The Barbara Perone at the Westchester University is very large. And then there's private collections. And it's just been really fun to meet people who have like a box of vintage twas and they'll bring it to one of my talks and, you know, go through it with me. And uh, I think we have between all the museums and the libraries in America, we have every edition that's ever been published. I don't think we've lost anything. Um, there's some that are only, you know, two, three copies, including the Troy Sentinel. But we, I think we have the whole sort of set. It's just not in one location. And there is no museum for Clement Seymour. Um, so one has to sort of travel around to be able to sort of see the whole, the whole sort of picture and, and see all these editions. So that's um, really what I wanted to say. And then if you have any questions you want to ask me or yeah. what do you think? Uh, well, uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's impressive. What was it that got you started on wanting to do this book? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> impressive. It really is from-, from well, Thank you. I think I, well, I, have a his, I have a history background, so I love history. And then I have an art background professionally because I was an art consultant for 25 years. So I think when you sort of bring some of your, you know, passions together, you know, I think that was it. But I also, this poem, I think is really important. And I, and I just think there's a risk of it being sort of overshadowed by all of the other, all the other books and all the other, you know, movies and everything else going on at this time of the year. And I thought it's having its birthday. I think it needs to be celebrated. I mean, I've seen Alice in Wonderland or Winnie the Pooh have milestones and celebrated. Mm -hmm. And I just thought I'm going to be part of this. And it's been really surprising to me that so few, I'm kind of the only person holding the balloons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm not sure why that is. I think, I think it's mainly because people want to celebrate 2023, the publication of it. I think I can't imagine the publishing world and Troy um, sent the Troy New York not getting involved in a bigger way. And I actually know that Troy is getting invo involved next year yeah. because that's where it was first published. And so, you know, it's a small city and I think they plan to really, you know, you know, 
go at it and, and really have some fun with it. Um, but I thought it was just an important, it's such an important story. It ties into so many other pieces of literature, as I've said, and so much art. So much came from this. It's, I think that was the interesting part of the book was, you know, it just so much came from this poem. Norman Rockwell, look at Norman Rockwell. I mean, it, you know, his paintings on the Saturday Evening Post of, of Santa Claus and Christmas come from this. They do. He painted a painting called Twas Night for Christmas. It, you know, and it's just Eddie Warhol, the Miss series, there's Santa Claus. And I just think it's an important piece. I think it's also because it's, it, even though it's based in Christianity, the Christian concept of non judgment and just, you know, kindness to one's neighbor and generosity of spirit, um, it's not it's not exclusive it includes everybody you know he, he's an elf you know he, he, he constitutionally he's allowed to be in a school he's an elf <laughs> he's not a religious character he's not a historical character i mean i had this discussion i was at a book fair and a woman was criticizing me for taking away the pipe and she was saying he's a, he, he is a, a historical figure and you can't mess with him and the man standing next to her was from the smithsonian and he went madam He's not a historical figure. He's a fictional character. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, one could say the same thing of Snoopy or Winnie the Pooh. I mean, sure, they have, because little children look to them to learn human values like love and compassion and friendship and all these things you learn through these, these great works of art or great works of literature, right? Um, but yeah, Winnie the Pooh, like you don't have to believe that Winnie the Pooh is a human being or alive to love Winnie the Pooh or to believe you know, Jimmy Cricket on a, on a rock wishing upon a star that hope is possible. You don't have, I mean, this is what I have a hard time when people just don't sort of want to go into the whole Santa story because they think it's sort of a, a lie. And I go, but it's not. It's teaching children these wonderful values of kindness and generosity and love and hope. And, you know, like a little child writing to Santa Claus and then, you know, looking under the tree and you know, all the excitement and then yes, he comes and like, it's all very positive. Right. Yeah. I've seen of having been a child once upon a time and having children and uh, having children in my life and, and seeing the impact that it has on them uh, when they discover Christmas, right. Yes. They discover the idea of Santa Claus, that Santa Claus, like that this person, uh, this uh, miracle maker, if you will, yeah. uh, travels the world in a night kind of thing, has has thought of you, that you're thought of, that you're important to somebody, right? And and really, if you think about yes, it, yes, well, there might, yes, yes, there might be, depending upon how you perceive Santa Claus. Yes. When if you celebrate this time of year and you and you celebrate Christmas, uh, you know, if you're a parent, if you're a friend, if you have people, uh, we're all Santa Claus because we all give to each other in some way it's important i think it's important i just can't even imagine winter without all the lights and the good spirit and good cheer i mean you look at the illustration of of you know the night before christmas he just he continually becomes this you know this happy character mm. you know non-threatening happy happy character right and uh and then of course i tried to put some of the Coca-Cola images in my book because I thought it is an important discussion of what Coca-Cola did, but they refused carte blanche because they said they'd never give copyright um, to anyone for any reason on uh, the images. But I didn't really, it didn't really bother me too much because one can simply Google, you know, Hayden Sunbloom and, and, and there they all are. So if you really want to see Coca-Cola images, but the important thing about Coca-Cola is that I think that he, they gave our Santa Claus a great big free PR campaign they went all over the world with him, you know, and, and I don't think it hurt the poem. I think it helped the poem. I don't think it, I don't think it hurt um, no. to share the joy of Santa Claus by having this huge American, you know, conglomerate do that. But no, it's, it's just been a really interesting. And I plan to be out on tour all next year. So I, I hope more libraries will contact me and I hope that I get to speak at more museums. And I plan to be in Manhattan next Christmas. I'm going to stay for Christmas and do the, the, two events that I didn't get to do this year. One is to visit the grave of Clement Seymour. They do a candlelight service with a wreath. And then they, there's another church um, that they also do a reading and, and a procession. And so I'd like to do both those and then, and then do some other events, of course, but I just had a great time out. I had loved being in America and I love these small towns. I had such a good time in Watertown. 
and I had a great time in Clayton. I went to their parade. It was <laughs> it was really fun. And uh, right yeah, it was great. Clayton's wonderful. It's, wonderful it's great. Yeah, it was very fun. And lots of lovely people. And I mean, when you're working on Toys Night for Christmas, it's, it's very, very happy, unless you bring up the tobacco thing. Then it's, <laughs> but, you know, aside from that, it's a very positive. And I, um, I realized too, when I was on tour, that the number one person who enjoys my book is a gentleman between the ages 70 and 75. And the reason for that is they would love it as a child. They read it to their children. And they read it to their grandchildren, or they are reading it to them. And what's lovely about that is that if they are indeed reading it to their grandchildren, those children will follow and fall in love with it as well. And then they'll have this great legacy going forward and memories of Christmas with this poem, and it'll continue. And so I was thrilled to see all these men, you know, and, and, I, and I don't really know why it's men, but possibly because women are cooking turkeys. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe well, they're reading the poem to their grandchildren. I don't know, but it's just interesting. It's been, I was at one event at the Hart Cluid in Troy and it was 150 people at the event and every single person fit that profile who bought the book. I think when you get to a certain age also, you, you can't help but have that kind of, you know, looking back, um, finding the little things that bring back those, those, uh, those memories, those warm memories too. Especially Christmas, because it's such a continuity. We do it, we do it in such a ritualistic way yeah. right yeah but i always have this thing where i say if you don't get it right one christmas because of something going on it's always next christmas you know <laughs> you know and, and and i think that you know uh I, I hope that we get to have you here uh next uh around this whether it be you know around christmas before uh you yeah know, and, uh, yeah. You know come well on. i just i i think somebody is some Somebody said to me that it was, um, you know, an interesting book. And I thought, if I can make history through a poem, you know, alive for people, like, that's great. Because yeah. I find history really interesting. But if, the, if people can learn American history through the poem, great. Right? Like, yeah. so there's lots, lots going on in the world of Twas. And this is the year to really celebrate. And I hope people read it. Uh, this book is on our shelf. Uh, Great. I think that you have made a fantastic contribution to Thank you. Uh, not just the poem, uh, but to really the history of Christmas in a lot of ways.